Stories come to life as we follow up on our alumni and friends who have been featured in CSUN Today. Let me first welcome you here to this these stories of life, which is what we're calling this series. It's a new series that we're, we're creating here at the, at the college as part of um, our, our strategic plan of putting our face out in the community and letting people know who we are and finding out about who they are and making sure people understand the footprints that we have in life here. And it turns out that the best way to do this is by having illustrious alumni like yourself come in and talk to us briefly about all these things that are going on in, in your life. So today I, I wanna say we have uh, Terry Stratton who is the CEO of El Dorado Health Centers in Northern California, which is uh, you know kind of nice to have you join us here down in Southern California. And she is a, a CSUN alum who graduated with a BS in health sciences and a master's in public health. So you have really run the entire gambit of what we offer in the, in the health sciences uh, here at CSUN. So thank you for coming. Her story um, on CSUN alum plans, COVID-19 vaccine distributions was published, for those of you who don't know, in the beginning of 2021. And it focused on her experience of working with healthcare during the early phases of the pandemic. Um, and we all know what that's been like. And the peak of COVID-19 uh, in California was awful. And I'm just glad to see that everyone's still around after the horrible things that we've all had to go through this terrible, terrible, terrible pandemic. So I won't take much time anymore. I'll introduce, I'll let um, Sal Esparza talk now, who has a lot more to say about her. She's one of their students. Thank you for joining us, uh, Ms. Stratton, and I look forward to hearing your conversation. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dean Webb, and, and thank you so much, Terry, for, for being here today. Uh, very excited to talk to you about this really an unprecedented time in our history uh, and how this pandemic has changed our uh, our public health and the way we view public health probably forever. Um, I'm going to start by asking you, asking Terry, some questions. And at the end of our conversation, we'll have time to open it up for questions uh, from the audience. Feel free to type your questions into the chat. And uh, our moderator, John Pepitone, We'll keep track and then we can go over them a little bit later. So Terry, um, nat nationally, we have seen a lot of progress in the course of this pandemic, but we're curious how things are going locally in your health centers. Well, thank you for this opportunity. And I appreciate the chance to kind of share my experiences uh, as a, an alum, CSUN alum. Um, so in El Dorado County, El Dorado is a primarily rural mountainous county in between Sacramento and the Nevada border, and it includes South Lake Tahoe. So we do have a fair amount of diversity in this uh, county. And uh, for us, I'd say we saw COVID a little later than more of the urban areas but it certainly hit us hard as well. So when I first gave the interview back in December, literally it was the day before we received our first shipment of Moderna for vaccinating our own staff. We now have uh, about 95% of our staff is vaccinated. And I did uh, make that a requirement, which was not necessarily well liked by all, but uh, we already have that requirement for the flu vaccine. So it seemed entirely appropriate to do it for, for COVID. And um, our quarantining of staff dropped from a revolving door basically to no door. The door has been closed. So that's awesome. We've seen that direct impact on our own staff and uh, we are very actively uh, treating um, folks with COVID. So we are doing telemedicine. We started in March of last year from basically the beginning of March doing zero, zero percent of a telemedicine visit mm. to 
the end of that month doing 90% of our visits wow. as a televisit. Right now, it remains at about 60%, 50 to 60% in long term. I absolutely do see it continuing, uh, not for everything, but I believe it's here to stay. And it is very appropriate for visits such as uh, they need to, a patient needs to touch base with their provider uh, prior to getting a refill of prescription. Uh, it has significantly dropped our no-show rate. Um, literally, the patients can, you know, call in or log in. They don't have to leave work. They don't have to drive to us. They don't have to worry about public transportation or the other barriers that otherwise exist. So that has been great, and we continue to vaccinate our community. Um, we vaccinate about seven or 800 a week, and I'm hoping to get at 1,000 a week. Um, we'll see where that goes, but um, every Saturday we have a drive through vaccination clinic where we do several hundred, and then uh, through the week, and have included things such as going to schools and vaccinating at a local school site and other you know, community location where we've partnered with those entities. So we are definitely seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, which is uh, fantastic. Uh, six months ago, it didn't, there was no light. <laughs> Not much light peeping through until the vaccine actually materialized. So, well, that's fantastic. So, so tell us, how did your education at CSUN prepare you for your CEO position uh, at El Dorado Health Centers? Yeah, I uh, absolutely prepared me, and I will give you a little bit of background. I actually worked for the state health department, Department of Public Health, for for many years, uh, as well as the county. And I have been in this role for um, almost eight years. So the things that I saw and it really identified where my education helped me, it really gave me practical application of the theory. And I will tell you as a, a, a new and uh, kind of journey person, health educator, because that's how I started, um, I saw colleagues who had very strong theory, but I feel like mine was theory with the practical application and um, really gave me a very sound foundation uh, and has enabled me to be flexible and work in many different areas of public health. Uh, I, if you saw the article before I worked in, uh, tobacco control and helped start uh, that program and worked on a lot of policy related things around public health, tobacco control, nutrition, domestic violence, women's health. Uh, I also spent uh, six years in emergency preparedness, which helped me tremendously in this current role. Um, and gave me much sounder view of what to expect in a pandemic when none of us have seen anything like that in our lifetime. But it was based in theory and practice and history and looking at um, what we have learned from you know, prior experience. So that was, that was great. Um, it also gave me a chance to really do things like problem solving. Uh, I can't underestimate uh, and underemphasize the importance of how that has been incredibly um, important in this past year, but it's important in public health because we continue to see new things, evolving things. Uh, public health is not a stagnant a field. There are new things coming all the time. So it, it really gave me a, a good sound foundation. And I did even reflect on uh, things and I'll, I'll ask you, do you still require 
MPH to do uh, student teaching at uh, junior college level, part of my, my MPH. And I, I think uh, just reflecting, it's not like I have used that per se, but it gave me more tools in my toolbox. Mm. And I really, um, that has been incredibly important to be able to have a diverse toolbox um, and particularly in the role that I'm in. So I, I thank uh, the college for doing that. And, and the program was a, fanta a fantastic face for me as a launching. That's as a great. way of That's... saying this, of course we can't do it anymore because faculty are all unionized and people have to be screened and ranked. And so we can't even hire people who are our MPH students if in fact there are other people who are on the list who meet the qualifications yeah. and who have been teaching here. So the, the, the rules have changed a lot. So that may be one of the I things that. that we can't do anymore, but it's certainly a wonderful idea. It would be wonderful if we could do that. Thanks Dean Webb. So, so Terry, um, there have been a lot of challenges with vaccine distribution. How have you dealt with them? And what have been some of the critical elements uh, of distributing the vaccine in your health centers? I clearly told my staff and our board of directors, I wanted to make vaccine uh, distribution uh, as our number one priority. So since the time we received vaccine, uh, we initially got it for our own staff in December, just before Christmas, and then received it for community vaccination in January. So we have made that as a priority um, for us. And we continue to do that. And I, I expect at some point as a community health center, we will just be incorporating it in to uh, kind of a standard vaccination as people come in for um, services that uh, we will be asking them for a vaccination and uh, putting more, um, as they say, shots in arms. So <laughs> that's, that's been a, a fundamental thing. You know, obviously initially there were not enough vaccine supply uh, available to meet everyone's interest in it. We had to stick to the priority tier levels. Uh, I will tell you that we even had on um, one day, we had a group of about 10 show up from the Bay Area. They had heard that we had vaccine and wanted to get vaccinated and did not meet the criteria. So I had to turn them away. Um, I, that didn't make me feel very happy, but uh, I also needed to understand that, you know, there is a priority for a reason and uh, we needed to be able to adhere to that um, for several different reasons. But so uh, we are getting at the point where there is plenty of vaccine and we initially received it from our county public health department, which we have a very strong relationship with. Um, and we work with them and we've collaborated with them on a lot of vaccine distribution and also identifying what we wanted to set as some uh, countywide priorities. But we now have plenty, so we received it from them uh, to, via this via uh, originating from the state. And uh, we continue to do that, although we are now have been switching to Blue Shield, who's the third party administrator. They have a completely different system in place of which we're having to adjust to. And our original application where we had to um, submit all of our provider information, information on all the refrigerators and freezers that we have for vaccine, um, you know, maintenance, as well as even things like our data loggers. <laughs> so we had to meet quite a bit of requirements and had to do it all over again once there was a 
uh, switching to uh, Blue Shield. So we're still working out a few of those little things. Um, HRSA, the Health Resources uh, Services Administration, who does fund us. We are a federally qualified health center. Recognize that we do have a specific focus on the underserved. Um, and uh, they are now giving us vaccine directly. So we now have several sources of receiving vaccine. Uh, certainly it's been working through a lot of different challenges, but I think making our priority as vaccine distribution uh, really supersedes any of those challenges and hurdles. And we've been able to work through any of those difficulties. Along those same lines, Terry, um, you know, you have, sounds like you have vaccines now, but there are still, there's still a lot of vaccine hesitancy going on. So what do you feel is the best way to educate those who may be hesitant about receiving the vaccine? Our partners and uh, the state and fed are really looking at a lot of those messages uh, and the whole messaging in, involved in it. I will tell you that I worked in tobacco control program when it was first uh, getting started. And uh, for those of you in public health know that that was really an internationally recognized program mm -hmm. in the successes that we achieved in, in California and as a model for the world. So reflecting on what we learned from that experience, you cannot rely on one message or one messenger to resonate with everyone. And it's really looking at a diversity of messaging, um, you know, from various standpoints. Um, some people will react to the health message. Other people may react to the economic opening and see it as a, an economic. Other people will, will see it as a way to get back into the entertainment uh, things that they like to do or travel or things like that. Uh, other people, it's their uh, seniors in their life or the children who are not yet vaccinated who may um, be that tipping point for a message. And, and again, as far as the messenger goes, um, we have uh, our medical director is a Latinx uh, woman and she has a great connection with that community within our um, county. So utilizing her as a, uh, a really strong messenger for that community has been really important too. So uh, that's my belief and that's what we're trying to do is really diversify, if you will say that, I'll say that, um, our messages and our messengers to try to reach the most people possible. And if you are not aware with El Dorado County, we do have a rural, I'm gonna say rural element to it. Um, and uh, that includes a very conservative uh, you know, group of folks. So that message will be completely different than it will be necessarily on a health message. And again, uh, the individual uh, receipt of that message is going to vary quite a bit as well. Ah. Yeah, I can I can certainly see that. You're is that an agricultural area, by the way? Come up and visit. We have a place called Apple Hill, and anything apple you can find, including apple wine and apple beer and. Uh, the whole gamut. <laughs> so there's a lot of agriculture related to that. And we have in the South County, a whole area of wineries. So uh, we do have an agricultural base there too. Listen, Terry, uh, we're, we're always coming up to our time. Do, anything else you want like to share with us uh, before we wrap up and start answering questions from the chat? Anything else you'd like to just about your experience and and the whole COVID issue. Yeah, I will I will tell you, I, I did receive a contact yesterday about starting to vaccinate adolescents, which uh, 
was absolutely we're we're you know game to go full full head steam ahead with that. Um, I'm totally supportive, as I mentioned before, of vaccinating as many as we can. But I think um, you know, kind of my bigger reflection is this pandemic has really put a spotlight in many ways on public health mm -hmm. and uh, really in many ways also given public health an opportunity to, I'm not gonna say reinvent, but maybe remarket itself in some ways and the importance of what we do and uh, really the, the field is just right right now for us to really say, this is the kind of things that we do, but we also have a humongous uh, uh, prevention focus. So let's use some of the things that are our base in looking at how do we use the prevention side for future things and to not, uh, uh, you know, get into a pandemic again. Um, but I, I think there are, is a lot of opportunity ahead of us and in, in how we frame ourselves. And I know that, um, you know, my mother, when she was alive, used to always ask me, what do you do in public health? <laughs> It was always, and I had friends who would ask me, I no longer get that question. That, that, that question has been answered for sure this last year, but I think in many ways, it has also presented an opportunity to, for us to clarify and for us to really work on our strengths about what we can contribute to the future. That's great, Terry. Thank you so much. Um, with that, with the few minutes we have left, um, I'd like to uh, invite the, the Dean back on and, and ask our moderator, John Pepitone, if there are any questions from the chat that we might have yeah, for there's Terry. A couple, there's a couple questions in the chat I have. One from uh, Rosine Dertovitian who asks, uh, we often have healthcare employees who can't take the vaccine due to health related issues. Um, she wanted to know if there was any, ins if you had any insight on this issue. So we have about six staff who are currently pregnant and have elected not to be vaccinated. So they have received a um, you know, waiver for now. We have one individual who we gave a, a religious exemption for, and uh, that is the extent of it. Uh, we have a committee which includes our medical director and for any staff member who requested a medical exemption had to go through our committee. And if you actually look at the CDC guidance on that, there are very few things that would exempt someone from getting vaccinated. So we use that and I would encourage you all to use that. I will tell you early on, we gave gift cards. So we use the incentive approach initially. And uh, then it was a little bit of a stick at the end. But um, at, at that point, almost everybody was vaccinated. Great, great. Good. The next question is from Andrew Oppenberg. Um, he wants to know what challenges did you have to overcome uh, in pivoting to telemedicine staff and providers and patients reimbursement? hardware, software? Given at the beginning of March, we were at 0% uh, telemedicine. And at the end of the March, we are at 90%. You can imagine that there was a lot of pivoting that happened uh, within that time frame. So we did not even have a platform, but we, did, we do have a, uh, an EMR system and they did have a platform. So we uh, quickly... Uh, purchased that and got that online. We had to purchase uh, laptops and uh, you know various other mechanisms for folks to be able to uh, have that remote session. Uh, there were a lot of things that happened in that midst. 
And about halfway through the month, when the governor put on a stay at home order, our visits dropped by about 75 or 80%. Wow. Um, we had to do something. And this was before there was a um, recognition the, to reimburse us for a remote visit for a televisit. And I made the call because I felt it was the right thing to do to tell our folks to go ahead and switch to televisits and we would let the policy implications work themselves out. Mm -hmm. They did work themselves out, um, but you have to be able to kind of see ahead around the corner and then take a bold step. It could have gone the other way, but that was the right thing to do. That's it for the questions in the chat. Dean Webb, any, do you have any questions for Terry? Oh, no, actually I have three comments for Terry. Uh, one has to do with this notion of emergency preparedness. Did you, while you were here, this is probably a question, have this as part of your curriculum or did you learn emergency preparedness as part of your work? I once worked in emergency preparedness and I didn't have it as part of my curriculum. So I'm wondering if you had it as part of yours. Well, I know at CSUN, I actually elected to take a class that was like a, almost like an EMT kind of class, uh, an advanced first aid. So I did have interest in it. Um, but when I started in emergency preparedness, it was right after 9-11 and right after all of the um, anthrax uh, issues, which was clearly a public health. Uh, the Department of Public Health did not have an emergency preparedness program. And um, I had started several programs, so I had that experience. Um, and they asked if I'd be willing to, to go and help launch that program, which I did. Um, I, I actually loved it. It was uh, an adrenaline rush frequently, <laughs> um, which I did like. And uh, I do like kind of the ability to build, build new programs. And I appreciated my public health background to be able to do that. I, I uh, definitely applied the things that I had learned. Thank you. I, the reason I'm asking this out loud in front of everyone is because I think this may be a new area for a SING um, program or certificate where we can have a program in preparing people who have public health backgrounds in emergency preparedness. So you gave a great idea. I just want to give a shout out to it. There was another question that came up too. I'm going to read this question and it's from um, Patty Kwan. She says, as a successful alumna of an MPH program, what advice do you have for our MPH students? We will be graduating 50 plus MPH students soon. Be open to possibilities. I never imagined my career would take the uh, interesting path that it did. Uh, I can tell you because I was willing to try something new, um, use my foundation to apply it to a different topic area, and really, you know, be able to be that lifelong learner and learn new things. It really took me in different ways than I ever expected. And I will tell you as a student, my, you know, kind of my core was to make a difference. And I assume that's why most of us go into public health. We wanna make a difference. I will tell you, I feel like I did make a difference and I have made a difference and continue to do that. And it is very satisfying and gratifying and at some times when things are extremely challenging, like this last year, sometimes that's the only thing that keeps you going. Mm. So uh, be open to possibilities and be flexible and seek out, um, you know, folks like myself. I've actually, we've had several, uh, you know, interns uh, look for interesting opportunities to either start your career or, or intern. Thank you. Well, the thing is really important is you certainly have made a difference.
obviously to us quite a bit. So thank you once again. I want to say two things that I was going to say earlier. Give a shout out to your county. Uh, your county is one of the largest counties for apiaries in the whole state. And because of that, we actually have the agricultural industry that we have. And by the way, you have the best pairs of anybody in the entire state. So <laughs> if you don't know that, pair. yeah, your pairs are fantastic. Um, I look for them yeah. in the store because they'll show you which county they come from. And when it says El Dorado County, I know they're fresh. I know they're good and juicy. And so I like to buy those. So thank you so much for joining us. We also want to thank you, Terry, and Sal. As well as uh, John Pepitone and Brenda Yara and Lauren Lafferty and I, Jean O'Sullivan, the crew who put all the stuff together. They do a lot of work behind the scenes that no one ever sees. So I want to say something to them out loud in public so everybody knows. So thank you all for doing this. And I want to thank the HHD, the Health and Human Development Reputational Pillar Team for putting together this idea. You guys have done fantastic work. I look forward to seeing more of this in the near future. And thank you for helping bring this to life. Okay, so have a good afternoon. And thank you so much, Terry, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Terry. You're welcome, my pleasure. Thank you all.